Grace, mercy, and peace are yours, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, from God our Heavenly Father, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, Jesus confronts us with some pretty hard words this morning. Love your enemies, he says. Wait, what, Jesus? Don't you know who my enemies are? What are you thinking? But Jesus doesn't let up from this challenge. No, he presses on. He says, those people who hate you, who curse you, who abuse you, yeah, those people, yeah, those are the people that you love. And not only that, but pray for them. And not in that way where you say, oh, I'll pray for you, but really you mean that I'm better than you and you should feel bad about yourself and, and yeah, you condemn them. No, actually, pray for them. Pray that they will repent, that they will turn and and not just feel bad, but that they would hear God's good message, his good news of grace, and that they would be changed, that they would have the same blessing that you have. Jesus, what are you talking about? What are you doing here? What are you trying to do to us? Don't you know what you're asking? And besides, my enemies, you know, I'm on your side, right, Jesus? Aren't aren't my enemies your enemies and and you're going to destroy them, right? So what are you talking about? Well, I think having this mindset means that Jesus' words today confront us. They, They give us a chance to rethink our own position. What is it that God's word says, and what have we imported into God's word from our culture? What is God actually asking us to do? What is he telling us? And where can we cut out our cultural impurities of God's word? So to do this, let's first start by looking at what scripture says about enemies. Now, if you were to start with your own experience, you could think of any number of people who would be your enemies. You might think of government officials, your coworkers, your neighbors, even family members, right? Any number of people. But regardless of that, we see that this often comes up because our culture, our American culture, is so polarized. We live in what has been dubbed cancel culture. Now, cancel culture is this set of rules, this mindset where you find someone who's sinned and then you cut them out of the picture. You cut them off, uh, you, you expel them from the public square, you cut, you, you cast them out, you silence them, you marginalize them. You basically treat them as if they're dead and this is to protect yourself. Because usually that sin that they've done is a threat to you, or you think it's a threat. It might even be perceived as a threat to your control over life, your control over reality. It pushes up us into these camps where we think of us versus them. We're good, they're bad, and we have to protect ourselves from them, and we And any measure is justified, even violence. Now, this is what cancel culture does. It pushes us to think in these terms. But what does Jesus say? If we were to look at Jesus' definition of enemies, he has a little bit different different picture. And he defines it in our text in, in a few verses right before our text in Luke this morning. Luke chapter 6, verses 22 and 27 through 28, Jesus says, Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. And then he goes on to say, I say to you who hear, love your enemies, those do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. So Jesus' definition is very different from the world's definition. Jesus defines enemies as those who hate you, who curse you, who abuse you. Now, that starts to sound like the world's definition, but 
Notice what Jesus does not say. He doesn't say those you hate, those you curse, those you revile. No. He rules this out. See, if, if you're the one who is doing the hating, the abusing, the cursing, we have to have a little discussion about repentance. But that's not the issue here. Jesus rules that out because his disciples are marked by love, just like he is. Instead, enemies are defined as those who set themselves against you, and they do it often violently. And they do it because you are being faithful, you're following Jesus. This is seen as persecution. It's not punishment for doing wrong, right? That's another issue, but it's persecution for faithfulness, for following Jesus. It's hatred for standing up for the truth. It's not uh, punishment or anger directed at you because you were a jerk to someone. No, this is different. But this definition from Jesus is not new. In fact, Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith, and so we see that he'll be consistent with all of Scripture. Now, we can look at a few examples from the Psalms that help express this. Psalm 17, verses 8 through 12, the psalmist says, Keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me in the shadow of your wings. From the wicked who do me violence, my deadly enemies who surround me, they close their hearts to pity. With their mouths they speak arrogantly. They have now surrounded our steps. They set their eyes to cast us to the ground. He is like a lion eager to tear, as a young lion lurking in, ang in ambush. The very next psalm has very similar sentiments. Psalm 18, verses 16 through 19, the psalmist writes, He sent from on high, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, this is speaking of the Lord, he rescued me from my strong enemy, and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place, he rescued me because he delighted in me. Skip to Psalm 38, 17 through 20, for I am ready to fall, and my pain is ever before me. I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin, but my foes are vigorous. They are mighty, and many are those who hate me wrongfully. Those who render me evil for good accuse me because I follow after good. We've seen a bit of a pattern here. And lastly, Psalm 102, verse 8. All the day my enemies taunt me. Those who deride me use my name for a curse. Now this is just a small sample from amongst the Psalms and from the greater context of the Old Testament. And so this, this idea of enemies is it's much larger and more complex than we can really uh, cover this morning. But the point of all this is that Jesus is consistent. Enemies of Jesus' own disciples are not people that the disciples go and choose. You don't go out looking for enemies. No, they will find you. Don't you doubt it. I'm sure you have experienced this plenty of times. And don't expect to be able to handle these enemies on your own. As the psalmist says, they're too mighty. The Lord is our helper. He's the one that we follow, that we look to. So as you follow Jesus, people will set themselves against you as you speak his truth, as you stand up for the gospel, for grace and forgiveness. Uh, people will set themselves against you. And don't be surprised if you feel overwhelmed by this. The intention is that you turn to Jesus and look to him for comfort. But oftentimes what we do is we have this tendency You'll notice this if you look through the Psalms is we have this dividing line, right? We have these camps, and we set ourselves on the side of the Lord. To an extent, this is true, uh, but what this does is we, it pits our enemies 
against not only us, but against God. Now, Jesus echoes this when he says that those who are not for me are against me, and they're scattered. And those who are against him are violently against him. So there is an element of truth here, the the way we experience it. Think about the Apostle Paul. So he began preaching the gospel. He had this shift. He was persecuting the church, and all of a sudden, this complete 180 turn happens. Now, all the people who would have been great friends of Paul, who would have really supported him because of his zeal for Judaism and his knowledge of Greek philosophy, all of a sudden, they turn on him, and they want nothing to do with him. They, they, they want to put him down. They want to silence him, marginalize. They even want to kill him, right? How dare you go and upset this system that we have with your preaching about this Jesus character? He was mocked. He was beaten. He was stoned, left for dead, persecuted, prosecuted, imprisoned. People conspired against him. But Paul didn't hold this against the people who set themselves against him. He didn't consider them his enemies. No, they were God's people that needed to hear this message. They had set themselves against him, but he would not reflect that anger, that hate, that violence, that cursing. Instead, he prayed for them. He prayed that God would reach their hearts and turn them. He endured their attacks, and he looked to God for deliverance, for sustenance. So when you speak God's truth, Those who don't want to hear it, and there's a lot of them, the whole world, they will rise up in anger and hatred against you. And it may be violent. They'll slander you, curse you, abuse you. But like Paul, you're called to endure this suffering and to pray and respond in love and blessing. But this isn't our inclination, is it? No. We remain sinners in this life. And so being on the right side, you might feel vindicated. We're right. They're wrong. We're good. They're bad. But what we do is we wall off into these camps. And when we're in those camps, it's easy to forget about grace. And then what do we do? We look to God to destroy our enemies. And we justify it. We say, well, they're God's enemies after all, right? So shouldn't we just call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Well, you might remember that from the Gospels. And we know how James and John turned out. Jesus rebuked them for this statement. Okay, okay, I get it. We're not supposed to treat other people as enemies. But what about spiritual forces, right? Uh, even if you manage to avoid casting other people as your enemies and treating them with contempt, you're undoubtedly going to take that bitterness that builds up in response to being hated and cursed and abused over and over again, and you're going to blame the spiritual forces, in our world. In other words, it's really easy to spiritualize Jesus' words, to ignore the people around us and just say, uh, it's the demons, right? It's these dark forces that are out to get us. And we might justify it. We can look to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. In Ephesians 6, 12, Paul writes, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Sounds like a pretty good good move. But Paul's addressing spiritual warfare here. He tells us that other human beings aren't our enemies, that they're not the ones we struggle against ultimately, but this doesn't deny that other human beings might become the instruments of these forces. We dare not dismiss or diminish the presence of real enemies 
in our midst. The psalmist knew this very well. And their response may not always be that godly, but people are out there who hate you and curse you and abuse you. We dare not deny it. Because this would only be a distraction from the real truth that's being clarified here in our text by Jesus. And here's that truth that we need to remember, that you and I were once enemies of God. Yes, we tend to forget that we too were blind, dead, and enemies of God in our sin, apart from Christ. We become self-righteous. We become indignant at the deceit and the hatred, the persecution, the violence that other people persecute, that they propagate against us. We get caught up in uh, power games, power struggles in this world, forgetting that Christ reigns, that his kingdom is true, that it is amongst us, and that he is Lord of all. We don't, ex- we don't live out our faith in that way. You see, James and Paul both address this problem. In James 4.4, 4, he writes, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And then in Romans, Paul writes, five verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 10, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. And one more, Paul writes to the Ephesians, chapter 2, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. You see, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it's not you and I who side with God, but it's God who sides with us. Left to ourselves, we make ourselves enemies of God, but God does not make himself an enemy of us. And he does this through his son. In his incarnation, Jesus bound himself to mankind forever, setting himself on our side. In your baptism, you were united with Christ. And being on God's side does not mean that you hate the world. God doesn't set up these camps like this. No, rather, you love the world despite its hatred for you. And you do this because the world is God's world, and he loves it. Psalm 24, 1 declares that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein. You are not to see other people as your enemies because God has redeemed them even if they set themselves against you. No, you are to love and show mercy to those who hate you, who have set themselves against you as your enemy, because that is what God has done for you in Christ. He has shown you mercy, shown you love and blessing and good, in despite all of your ungratefulness and hatred that you once had, and sometimes still do, if we're honest. Now, saying this doesn't necessarily make it easy to do. Cancel culture is around us, and we have to acknowledge that this society that we live in, it shapes us. It directs our thinking, the way we talk and act and think. And cancel culture has no place for forgiveness. 
But Jesus gives us a different perspective. Jesus gives us a glimpse into the resurrection, the resurrection life that is yours now because you are baptized and risen with him, even while you wait for its fulfillment and his return. Yes, you have enemies who hate you, who curse you and abuse you, but they have no real power ultimately. You see, the kingdom of God is yours. Christ reigns and it will be manifest fully when he returns. The kingdom of this world will come to nothing and it will become mere world, albeit a new world. Jesus gives you a resurrection perspective, a glimpse beyond the chaos, the hatred, the deceit, the power games of this world, the struggles of this broken world. He gives you a glimpse beyond that and into the order, the peace, the joy, the mercy of the new creation. It's a glimpse into his kingdom where mercy rights wrongs, not an equal and opposite reaction of hatred and violence. But the world doesn't understand this. And so it hates this vision. But you who are redeemed, you know that this is the way of life and truth and goodness and beauty. And that's what we are called to follow. We can consider the Old Testament example of Joseph from our Old Testament reading this morning. Joseph exemplifies this. So as you recall, Joseph was uh, the favorite son of Jacob, the, the patriarch who, who gave the name Israel to his people, right? Uh, Israel came from Jacob. And uh, Joseph was one of 12 sons. He was the favorite son. And because of this, all of his other brothers hated Joseph. Well, he had these dreams, and he started talking about these dreams, and the dreams said that he was going to rule over them. Oh, and they couldn't stand it. They decided it was time to cancel Joseph. So he dug a pit and threw him in here, in there, and they were going to kill him. And the oldest brother, Reuben, thought he would get in with his dad by saving him and say, let's not kill him, hold off. Well, while he was waiting, they ended up selling him into slavery, so he was canceled anyway, right? He, he's essentially treated as dead. And he goes off to Egypt. He's sold into slavery. He's abused by people that he worked faithfully for, Potiphar's wife trying to catch him in adultery. And he goes to prison, and he waits, and he languishes in prison even after interpreting dreams for people. He does good, and he waits on the Lord. Well, finally, the Lord works through Joseph, and he brings Joseph to prominence, and he does this work to combat a famine, and he saves the land, and Joseph's brothers come down to Egypt to get food. In our reading today, we see Joseph revealing himself. He essentially has a resurrection amongst his brothers, and they are shocked. They don't know what to do because they know the sin they have propagated against him. And according to our standards, jo Joseph should have canceled them. He should have put them into prison, had them killed, put them out. But no, Joseph doesn't do that. He forgives them. He shows mercy, mercy and compassion because he has a different perspective. He tells them, this wasn't your doing, this was God's doing. I know there's a bigger plan. God's working. And he has had mercy on me. And so I have mercy on you. And that's what we're called to do. To show mercy and to forgive other people. This is what Jesus is calling us to do this morning. Love your enemies. It sounds hard. It is hard oftentimes, dear brothers and sisters. But we do this because that's what God has done to us. You were his enemy, and he had every right to cancel you, to marginalize you, to call you out, 
to kill you, but he didn't. He loved you. He's blessed you. He saved you by the work of his son. And because of this, he calls us to do the same amongst other people that he loves and that he's blessing, that he's calling to repentance. He did not count himself as an enemy to you, even though he could have, even when you set yourself against him. And to all those people out there, that's what he's doing. They've set themselves against him, but he will not set himself against them. He loves them. He has mercy on them. And so as disciples of Jesus, he calls us to do the same, to love those who hate us, to bless those who curse us, to do good and to pray for them because God has done it for us. He's done it for you. And he is working to reclaim his world. And so how do you do this? You forgive. You forgive as Christ has forgiven you. Doing this embodies what God has done for you. This is the way of a disciple. You live your faith. So when people hate you and curse you and revile you and deceive you, you forgive them. When others rise up in hatred against you for speaking God's truth, for following Jesus, for showing mercy instead of canceling the people who sin against you, remember the abundant mercy of your Father to you. Do not be discouraged by the enemies in your midst, despite how, how violently they rage against you, they attack you and belittle you. Instead, be encouraged by the boundless mercy and love and forgiveness of your Father to you in Christ Jesus, his Son, our Lord. And trust that he does, in fact, work in small acts of mercy. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, you call us as your disciples to love our enemies. And this is hard, Jesus, because so often we make others our enemies. Help us to see others not as our enemies, but as your beloved people who fight against us and against him. Grant us to show mercy as you have shown mercy to us and to forgive others as you have forgiven us. You've given us your spirit. Empower us to do this. Open our eyes to see the vision of the new creation that is before us and grant us hope to wait patiently for that day when you return and make all things new. In your name we pray. Amen.